So good to be together this morning. Grateful for the opportunity for us again to worship and sing praises and be together in our fellowship and now to open up God's word. We pray that there'll be some, some things that we can gain and be encouraged by as we give honor to God and learn from his will. In Matthew chapter 2, that was just read, uh, in some uh, places maybe we often have heard, maybe this is what we refer to as the Christmas story, whether it's the Christmas story or not, it is the gospel story. It is actually the beginning of the gospel. Uh, both Matthew and Luke take great pains to go through the beginning stages of how Jesus made it into this world. And that has so much uh, relevance and importance uh, because it holds true, really, to the symbols and the uh, themes that Jesus, as a mature man, preached all of his life. And it seems very fitting that as we read about the things that Jesus, when he was at the age of 30-some years old, he didn't begin preaching publicly until he was about the age of 30 years old, after he was baptized by John the Baptist. Of course, while many of, of uh, association is given to what he preached and what he taught, but even his teaching, even his preaching can be very, very well misunderstood, as often it was, even when he was preaching it. Jesus, made, make, no, make it clear in our minds, Jesus came to preach ultimately a message of peace. In fact, what's so ironic about the message is that that message of peace is what ultimately got him crucified in the most violent fashion. It was because he was preaching to people that were so full of animosity, full, so full of rage, so full of anger, so full of hate, and they felt justified in those passions. They felt justified to feel those things against their enemies. They felt justified to feel um, that certain things should be done vindictively against those who were opposing God. And Jesus, of all people who claimed to be God, was teaching a message really of saying, I think we need to wage war in an inner war against ourselves rather than seek vengeance and war against everyone around us. <laughs> he was someone who preached all through that message of inner peace, that there is a war waging within us, and if we can, if we can truly humble ourselves, and that's really what it takes, it's going to take true humility to look at ourselves and admit that there are things within us that need to be killed. There are passions within us that need to be crucified. There are attitudes that we cultivate that cannot have anything to do with the God of heaven. That is the message that Jesus preached, told me that we would have peace with God, ultimately bringing peace with ourselves and peace with one another. Fellowship, harmony, joyful coexistence where God is at the center and he is honored and he is revered and we are joyfully recognizing that we all belong together, humanity with God. But while even many times we as Christians, I think sometimes we very easily can be misguided, the world can easily be misguided. But remember the Bible says it. what makes the, the truth of God stand out is the message of consistency. We recognize that the message from the Old Testament doesn't really veer off from the message of the New Testament. It's really one perfect, complete, concise picture. I think that's why it's so important that when we want to make sure that we have a consistency of what the message of Christ is, it, it makes sense. Let's start at the beginning. Because even his entrance into the world really represented what his whole uh, message was all about. It was innocence versus wickedness. He came into the world representing the most innocent form that any human being can ever have, and that's of an innocent child. An innocent human being that is free from even knowing between right and wrong. An innocent human being that is so pure, it almost causes us to kind of stand back in awe of it and, and, and be filled with wonder because we in our mature state sometimes are so far from it. Or maybe feel it's a distant memory of our past, the innocence of our childlike days. 
And what's interesting is that Jesus came innocently, but proclaimed in his innocence to be that is king. That was the message. Innocence is king. Purity is king. Righteousness is king. And there could be no greater exemplary form of human righteousness or purity than that of a childlike state of innocence that is free from anything that's sinful. And then notice how immediately that was clashed against human kings, human rulers, who right away, isn't it amazing, they were so, so detested the idea that they would be in competition, that their ideas, that their throne of prominence, that it would be a threat. And immediately we see the clash and we see the war that waged against Jesus as a baby. And that's what we see in, in Matthew chapter 2. What's interesting is the gospel of a Savior begins with two individuals who are put in the task of saving the Savior. And I find that interesting. They were put in the responsibility of protecting and saving the Savior. That was one of the first things that any individual who came in contact with Jesus was tasked to do. To save the life of the one who came to save the lives of all of us. But let's continue reading there in Matthew chapter 2. There notice it says that the Magi being warned by God not to come back to report to the king as he was, they were instructed. No doubt that was, a, that was a trap. And it says there in verse 11, it says, After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now, when they had gone, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. What contradiction of events of human history. A child, innocence, representing royal magnificence of God in human form and immediately is met with, let's kill it. <laughs> Amazing. So the first task given to human beings that, as they're in charge and, and, and blessed with the presence of Jesus is really protection. Protect this child, take him, run away, get him into safety because there's someone evil seeking to do away with all the good that Jesus wants to bring into this world. And that was one of the amazing tasks given to Mary and Joseph. In other words, now that the, the nine months had passed of, of Mary protecting the growing child in her womb, which she magnificently did and faithfully did, and faithfully gave birth to the child in... in, in uh, very odd and troubling circumstances where they couldn't find any place to keep them any comfort and had to make do with the circumstances they had to make up and, and in all things to give birth in those wild circumstances of travel and expense and worry and wonder, where are we going? Where are we going to stay? Nobody has any room for us. And now the child's coming out. Mary, what a wonderful example she is of her faithfulness, making do of trusting that God would provide what they needed in that desperate situation. And now again, very little time has passed, and yet now again they're tested. She must protect the child. And it says, notice it says that they were going to search for Jesus, and they were going to destroy him. And so in verse 14 it says, So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son. So while well, thankfully you can see, you read, that, read that sigh of relief in those verses. Thankfully, thankfully, Jesus is saved. He is restored, but, but not without great expense and great tragedy and, and casualty. No, Herod didn't get the child. Sadly and horrifically, he got many. And many suffered because of what Jesus was bringing into the world. Amazing. Because of the message and because of the presence of Jesus, others sadly suffered. It says in verse 16, 
Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. In other words, it wasn't just the child. It seems that the king is bent on destroying all forms of innocence. Not just the royal representation of it. It says, but any, any, anything associated with it, kill all the children. Wow. That really is just pure evil. But what it is, it, there's a set, evil wants to protect itself, doesn't it? That's the idea the king wanted to protect his prominence. The king wanted to protect and restore and save all the things that he wanted to live for. And he felt threatened by those things and wanted, went on a rampage to destroy anything that seemed to be against it. And he was not successful, thankfully. that They were successful in rescuing and saving and harboring Jesus to safety. But there in verse 17, it says, Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah. Weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children. And she refused to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. And said, get up, take the child and his mother and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in, in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill... What was spoken through the prophets, he shall be called the Nazarene. Amazing chapter of many events swirling around and all of it centering around the need to preserve this child. Great sacrifices were made at the expense of making sure that this child must not be touched. This child must be preserved. The sake of the world rested on the shoulders of Jesus on, on his life and the blood flowing through his veins. And then the parents, Joseph and Mary, given the task to preserve Jesus. And I just want to, as we look at that, I want to ask ourselves, in what sense are we being called today to save the Savior? I believe there is a call to save the Savior and what we need to be saving, I believe, are the efforts of preserving his teaching. Preserving the affluence and the growth and the spread of everything Jesus taught. That still is, a, is something that is greatly threatened in our lifetime. Greatly threatened in our society. And so I want to look at the story in terms of the human beginning and origin of, of Jesus coming to this world that we might recognize that in some way we who have also come in contact with Jesus uh, by, 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 by amazing fashion, not just as an infant child, but in, in his human f form of, uh, of laying his life before us on a cross, being killed, being sacrificed, being raised from the dead, we being blessed to be saved by the blood of Jesus have also been given a task. And that is that we might preserve or save and do whatever it takes to protect all threats against putting out the message of Jesus. And they're being done. They're being made. Many efforts, no doubt, are being made to make sure that we keep quiet. I just want to look at three specific areas where we might learn how much is placed upon our shoulders that we might gain courage and we might gain Trust in God, that God will be with us as he was with Joseph and Mary. But that we would step out in faith and simply be obedient for the urgency of preserving the message. One of the first areas we want to look at is certainly in, in our world. All you have to do is look around us and look at the increasing nature of sin 
and the increasing nature of the damage and the horrific things that sin brings into our life and, and, and how many influences are being made to support, really, and, and hold that up to, to, to not counter it, to not challenge it, but to accept it, to promote it, to allow every avenue, whether it's through entertainment, whether it's through... Uh, individuals of prominence, politicians, whatever, whatever it is, anybody who has a stage, individuals are being promoted to stand on various platforms and promote agendas and promote information and promote lifestyles that are bent on, just as Herod, to destroy purity. To destroy any message that sounds very similar to the gospel that Jesus brought. And our world is scooping it up. All of us are, are threatened by that. From the time as they're little children, what we're being exposed to being taught, what other individuals that we go to school with and work with and those that we're raising our, our children, our families, and, our, and the neighborhoods we live in across the street, who we interact with on a daily basis. And we have been given the task to rather than take the, the form of Jesus and take him to some remote location. Rather, we have been told, go out and spread into the highways and the byways and make sure that these attempts to squash out the message of Jesus are unsuccessful. That those who are faithful to the cause of Christ would make sure that we are doing every effort to protect and to save the purity of the message. Go over to Revelation chapter 12. It's a very beautiful and really... Um, uh, almost some, somewhat frightening image of what this looked like even in the New Testament age. Even those who were saved by the message of Jesus, but were saved by the gospel of Jesus. Remember what the first thing that they were up against? What were the first Christians up against? Make sure that the enemy does not succeed to stomp out the message. Well, that was number one agenda. The first thing faithful Christians had to do was make sure they had the courage and that they had the faith to say, we will preserve the message by spreading it. We will preserve the message by teaching it. We will preserve the message by handing it hand to hand into as many people as we can possibly get it to because we recognize how much effort, how much expense, how much threats are being made just to stomp it out. And let us remember, certainly not even... Maybe, maybe we don't maybe feel this immediate threat in our own immediate neighborhood, but certainly worldwide. There are areas where it's being made to threaten individuals who believe in the story of the gospel, who believe that Jesus is the Savior, that anyone who believes in him that might be threatened even with death for even speaking out about it. Efforts are being made. And notice, as the efforts were made even amongst the apostles and the original Christians, turn over to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 paints again a very interesting uh, uh, image of this conflict. In Revelation chapter 12, read verse 1. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. It says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And on her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And we're not uh, just making this up. In fact, the revelation has, again, this drastic imagery of just the attempts of Satan to stop out the message. That is his intent, to devour and to keep this message from flourishing. He is bent on it. Verse 5. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven. 
Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. That's a wonderful statement. They were not strong enough to stomp out the message and the power of the gospel. There was, this, they were, there was no longer a place found for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down. The serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. And notice, they overcame him. As Joseph and Mary overcame the attempts of Herod, to stomp out the progression of the message of innocence and righteousness and goodness and purity. So those who were saved by Jesus also were successful. They saved the message. They preserved the message. Think about that. Why do we have Bibles today? Why are you and I able to open up freely the word of an, an, an internet form on your phones, on your computers, whatever form it has? We are able to have a Bible and read of this message because individuals were not afraid of the attempts to stomp out the message in their day and they bravely and courageously went everywhere and they preached the message. It was more than just, we need to preach the truth. We must preserve the message. And it prevailed because they recognized how great the threat of the enemy was to keep it from thriving. And they realized God is going to win but we must be faithful. So that's what it says. It says in verse 11, and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony and they did not love their life even when faced with death. I love that phrase. Because, why did they prevail? Because of the word of their testimony. We have not been given the physical body of Jesus to take him and move him to a safe location. But you know, you have been given. We have been entrusted this sacred trust that several, many attempts years ago in history before we were ever around made violent attempts to make sure we would never have this. And isn't that amazing? Well, guess what? Now, while we can be thankful for what they did, we are now a part of the story. And the question is, what will you do to preserve the message in Wellsburg, in Steubenville? In West Virginia, Ohio Valley. Let us not take for granted and underestimate. The devil is seeking to do one thing, to stop out the spread of this message. We can be the part of what Joseph and Mary did in their day to make sure it reaches safety. And there's no safer place for this to be than lodged in the hearts of other human beings. Planted. And isn't it amazing? That's what Jesus said the parable of the sower. He said, he recognized all we need to do is plant that seed. And the seed is so powerful that even when it's planted, when it finds root, it is able to grow. How? We don't know. It says, I love the parable of Mark. How? We don't understand. All we know is it works. And if we have the courage and we have the faith in God to trust that it needs preserved more than just in publishing, it needs preserved more than just in making sure we have Bibles that are able to be, we need to be spreading it and making sure hearts have a place where it is lodged. Let us preserve and do that work of saving the message. Turn over to Acts chapter 5. I love, the, 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 here's one example of, some of the, what, what individuals before us were up against. And they have entrusted their work into our hands. It's like a, it's like a relay race. It talks about the race. Well, we know the part that they raced. Boy, was that a difficult run. Was that a difficult leg to run. Here's, here's a part of the leg of the race that some of these individuals had to race and how they were able to get the baton in the hands of others. It's finally reached us. But, the, but we, we see situations like this in Acts chapter 5 and verse 27. It says, when they had brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them saying, we gave you strict orders not to continue 
teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. How many beatings, how many imprisonments, how many threats, and how many vicious attempts to destroy people's families were made just to get them stop teaching people about Jesus. And they, like Joseph and Mary and others who were entrusted with the faith of delivering Jesus to safety, they were faithful. Listen to their response. In verse 29, But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Why do we need to preserve these sins? Because wickedness is still prevailing on this earth and Jesus has the the cleansing power to revert. That's repentance is. Revert from your wicked thoughts and your wicked ways and your wicked ambitions and turn to God. Lord knows how this world needs to hear that. Bent on destroying anything that represents innocence or purity. If ever there's a time that God needs faithful individuals to stand up and say, we will make sure this gets to safety, it's us. And the safest place is planted in the hearts of other people. We need to preserve it. And how much work was done just to get it to us. That's the question. Will it die with us or will it flourish with us? Let us sit on that. Will it die with you or will it grow with you? The choice is ours. And not only that, but how many of us have also been blessed like Jesus was in his innocent state to be blessed with others? Children. Most innocent form. Come to us. Blessed that we might be the guardians, the parents, the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, the brothers, the sisters. What has been charged with us? I'll tell you what we need need to think about. Remember what Jesus came innocent as a child. And remember this. I love that lesson that Nathan brought not too long ago about, the, again, the innocence that children, Jesus always, he always pointed to children. He always put it back to his innocence that as a child. Say, if you want, if you want an, uh, or, or, or a goal to set for what is, what is the purpose of, of his gospel, it's to set the time back to when we were the most innocent as children. Because guess what? That has become lost in the development of human beings and we all lose it. When we are given the choice between right and wrong and temptation gets the best of us, we'll talk about that tonight, the temptations we face. Sadly, the Bible even teaches, it reminds us, we've all given it in. And it is corrupted and we have sacrificed and we've compromised our innocent state. And Jesus came to revert that back, to save that, to, to restore that. Now turn over to Romans chapter 16. I love this passage. In fact, even, even as grown adults that are learning to be innocent like God. Think of this verse. I love what, G, what Paul, Paul said. In other words, if, if ever there was a, a statement of, of, of say that this, this is our, our, uh, our, uh, our success statement or, 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 or our mission statement. I remember when, this time of year, when I, I worked at a factory uh, called Steer, Steer Enterprises and... Uh, Ohio, and this time of year, we'd always they'd be putting things in a hat, in a box. What do you think next year's mission statement ought to be? And every year, we'd, they'd, well, if there was a winner, they'd be rewarded. Yeah, this is, this is a great mission statement. Something we need to have lodged in our minds. of This is what we're aiming for. Words, don't get lost in all the specific things that are going on in this factory. And remember, there's one thing in mind. If we don't reach this one goal, everything else is for naught. Paul has a mission statement for us like that. Turn to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16 and verse 19. 
He says, for the report of your obedience has reached all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you, but I, I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. In other words, what he says, I want most of your mind and most of your thoughts to be a pleasant place for good, good things, good thoughts, good, pure, wholesome ideas and principles are flourishing and have very little room for even knowing about the evil, destructive things that Satan wants to plant in our minds. That's what Jesus wanted to restore, to save. In fact, that's why the gospel is such a profound thing because it actually means we must be born again to go back to the place where innocence was at its most flourishing in our minds and to flush out and to crucify all the things of the flesh that have been an open door to let it all come flooding in. He says, get rid of it and let us be filled with all that is good. That's our mission statement. That's God's mission statement for humanity. Flush out all of the evil. Fill in all the good. Will we do our duty to keep that with our children? Will we teach our children? Will we let that message be grounded in our children? Even at this early stage, will we make sure that we teach them not to be so such a hurry to know all of the, the condemning, just vile Damaging thoughts that we don't, have, we, don't, we don't need them in our, in our minds as adults, let alone ever in our life. But so many, so many times in our society, there's this, there's this push to get children to grow up and to almost skip over innocence. They might immediately behave and, and, and feel as if they're mature adults. And I think part of that reason is, again, the world does not want innocence in its midst. What better way than to skip over that period of a child's life and encourage and motivate? Paul says, no, I'd rather have you even not even know about certain things. I would rather you be so innocent that you're actually ignorant about some of these evil things and that you are flourishing in your mind about all the good things. Turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And so we, if we're parents, family members, those who know we have little ones in our presence, little ones, little minds, little hearts. Let us do everything we can to save the message of purity and innocence and promote that. And to teach them, encourage them that, that no, while they may be tempted to think, well, that's not cool. That's not cool to be pure of mind. And that's what they, what they started. They, I remember that, that's, that's the... the, the the first thing we do, right? The, 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 the temptation we face in our peer groups. The cool ones were the ones who were so fast and so able, they, they skipped over, <laughs> and just flushed out and killed whatever was innocent in their hearts. It was that picture of, remember, what was that? Uh, when Van Halen came out with the picture of the little boy with the angel with the cigarette in his mouth. Yeah, that's cool. How, how, how fast can we corrupt an innocent mind? That's what the world thinks is cool. How quickly can we skip over innocence and get them right in the midst of the filth of the party scene? Jesus wanted us as adults and those who know that there's a message of innocence and purity to, to make sure that we're promoting that even amongst children. In Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10 and verse 13, he says, and, and they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms 
and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. And then in another passage, just to show how intent his message was always to flourish innocent. He loved children. He loved the innocence of children because he wanted that to be the picture. That was the picture, really, of his message that I want people in their minds to be as pure and innocent as these small children. And remember what he taught. What if, what if those who don't take that responsibility, what if we cause the little one to stumble? What if we allow the little one to get too close to it when it's not time for them or should never be a time for them in their life? Jesus said, it would be better to put a millstone around my neck and throw me into the depth of the sea. Lest I betray my responsibility as an adult with children. To save their innocence. As much as I can at least to, to promote that. So that even when they inevitably realize there's going to be a departure from that. They feel enough guilt and conviction. They want to go back to it. And that's something that we have a responsibility as adults. Will we save the purity and the innocence of the message of Jesus. And try to. Let that flourish as much as we can, especially with the young ones who are with us. And one final point. Will we do everything possible to preserve the most beautiful of relationships that God blessed us in humanity that our world has corrupted and perverted and polluted? And that is the image of the purity of the relationship between a husband and wife in marriage. Will we who are husbands and wives, will we who are in this relationship, will we realize Jesus has placed upon our responsibility to preserve the beauty and the innocence that is intended to be in marriage. To not compromise with the worldly beliefs and thoughts that we don't owe each other fidelity, we don't owe each other loyalty, we don't owe each other respect and honor. That is being constantly threatened. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. And I believe what amazing thoughts Jesus put and associated with marriage. That we would recognize it was always God's intent for the highest ideal of honor and respect. To be associated with husbands and wives in their marriages. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. He says, husbands love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it. There's something pure and innocent in that, isn't there? The purity and innocence, the chivalry of saying this is what they need and I'm going to provide my life to, to, to save them. It says, husbands, you be the saviors of your wives. Husbands, you be chivalrous to your women. Husbands, you realize it's your job to protect them and to honor them and cherish them. Recognize their vulnerabilities and their weaknesses. Not manipulate them. Not twist them. Not use them to your advantage. But to be protective of them. Give yourself up for them. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. Words, there's nothing more beautiful and innocent than a child saying, look at the diamond I found. And saying, I found it this way. <laughs> and I'm going to protect it from getting smudged and diminished in any way. It's a, it's a precious jewel. And husbands are called to treat their wives that way. That when we found them, <laughs> it is our job to return them in that fashion as a precious jewel to be honored and to be protected notice in verse 28 he says so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies he who loves his own wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church that's the image to nourish and cherish your wife what are you going to do with it your job to save it yeah because <laughs> the world isn't doing it <laughs> the world is infiltrating the world's kicked the door down and spread all of their animosity against it will you reserve it's worth saving preserving and living that way as much as we can with one another 
we come to the end of this, as we, there's so many other things, no doubt, that, that God has charged into us, has given to us. What I love about this is that the reason that ultimately Jesus wants us to be busy preserving these precious elements of Jesus is so that he can then be the savior of the world. We must hold these ideals. We must hold these, these principles at the highest degree and preserve them because these are the things that Jesus wants to use to convict the rest of the world in their darkness that they might be the beneficiaries of his death, that he died for them to save them. If you're with us as you never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we encourage you that you would respond to what Jesus did to save you. That you would recognize that you are the one that he honors, that you are the one he cherishes, you are the one that he truly wishes to reserve and, and to keep as close as possible in, as an heir. But you need saved, you need cleansed, you need washed, you need to be reborn. Let Jesus take care of those things for you by you responding in faith to your conditions. That you would confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and based upon that confession, you would repent and turn away from the sinful things of this world and that you would be restored in purity and innocence and serve him with all faithfulness in your life. Would you come to the front of this auditorium? We're about to stand and sing a song. While we stand and sing, would you come to the front? We'll gladly assist you to put on Christ in baptism while we stand and sing together.